And the safest form of money you can have in traditional finance is the liability of the government. Just to put it simply, I just don't trust the banking system because of everything that you've just described. I think the stress is coming to surface now. We have had the first default of a commercial mortgage-backed security of over $500 million. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the show. I'm pumped to have Alf back here. You're such a thoughtful thinker in the legacy how the legacy financial system works and fixed income. And I love those types of conversations. So welcome to the show, Alf. Preston, my pleasure to be here. And I guess a lot of people will be wanting to know what's going on in the banking sector, what's causing all this trouble. And so let's see if my experience can help the audience understand a bit further what's going on. That's where I, that's exactly where I want to start is so because you have such a depth of understanding of, of the legacy system, I guess my first question is just like, what's your one over the world of everything that's happening and prioritize, like, this is one of the most important things that people really need to be focusing in on and, and understanding because it has like all these other compounding effects beneath it. So where would you start? So look, um, I think money's been misunderstood at a higher level of, um, management, even in the financial industry. Look, money in the traditional banking system or in the traditional finance um, economy works as follows. There are different layers. And the safest form of money you can have in traditional finance is the liability of the government. So your money is very often a liability of somebody else in the traditional finance system. So please understand that. And there are different kinds of risk that you can run by owning money in the traditional finance space, mainly two risks. Your money can be the liability of the government, or it can be the liability of a bank. Let's first talk about the liability of a bank. A bank deposit, especially above 100,000 euro in Europe or above $250,000 in the US, is nothing else than an unsecured loan to a bank. As we are seeing, if the bank has any stress, any mismanagement, has mismanaged the risk, um, has run a certain amount of interest rate risk, which was not hedged, your money can be at some point even just wiped away. So that means you are effectively lending unsecured your money to the bank above the $250,000. That's always been the case, Preston, by design. If your money at a bank is below $250,000, you have the implicit guarantee of the government of the United States. So you fall into the second bucket, which is your money is the liability of the government in this case, rather than the liability of a bank. But it's always the liability of something in the, tr in the traditional finance space. Now, the liability of the government of the United States is a better proposition than being a senior lender unsecured to a bank simply because the government of the United States issues the very currency, issues the very money that we use in the system. So effectively, the government of the United States can always try to blow a hole in their balance sheet through deficits and print more of this money that we use in the system. So effectively, you are somehow a bit more protected in nominal terms by having money as a liability of the government than as a liability of a bank. People are now finding that out because depositors of SVB have been wiped out effectively. The FDIC came in and said, no, 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 we're going to make an exception. We're going to guarantee your deposits even above the $250,000. Basically, the government is saying you were an unsecured uh, lender to SVB will make you now whole by transforming your money from the liability of a bank to the liability of the government. So we will make you whole basically through that process. People are finding that out, but this is the first big picture observation I have in the traditional finance system. Your money is always a liability of somebody else, Preston. So choose wisely which liability you want it to be. An unsecured liability of a bank, that's pretty risky because you're often not even rewarded for that risk in the first place. These bank deposits don't yield much in the first place. or do you want it to be a liability of the government of the United States through many of its forms? It can be a bank deposit below $250,000. It's implicitly guaranteed. It can be a T-bill. It can be a money market fund deposit, which is basically guaranteed by the government. But 
pick your fighter. You always, your money is always an unsecured liability of somebody else in the traditional finance space. So, you know, people were looking at that action with the Silicon Valley Bank and they're saying, okay, well, FDIC was supposed to be anything above the 250K that those depositors are now at risk of of the actions of that bank. Um, So the government steps in, totally backstops everybody, all the deposits at the bank. And they've set up this new precedence of, well, the government might step in and maybe the limit really isn't 250K if you're if you're banked with a large enough bank, which created this incentive of, hey, I need to get out of my community bank and I need to put my deposits at Bank of America or whatever. Um, first of all, is is there something similar happening in Europe to what happened in the US? And if so, kind of describe that to us. And then more just your general thoughts on this incentive that's now popping out of these actions and what it means moving forward. Look, Preston, um, it all boils down to the incentive schemes that regulators have given banks in the US and in Europe. Because, you know, obviously banks are there to try and make money and they have to try and not take too many risks because they are so important to the traditional finance space. Their stability is so important that they're heavily regulated. The U.S. has failed pretty miserably, I should say, in regulating small banks. So let me let me uh, tell you what I mean. In the U.S., if you're a bank below two hundred fifty billion dollars in assets, and mind me, Preston, this is a pretty large bank. I mean, two hundred billion in assets is not peanuts. It can be a pretty Mm -hmm. large bank anyway. But that was the threshold. Below two hundred fifty billion dollars in assets, you are basically exempt from the main stringent regulation that the regulators have applied to large banks after the great financial crisis. So namely, you don't have to stick to something called the net stable funding ratio. It's a lot of words, but in reality, it's just a ratio that tries to make sure that the funding of a bank is not concentrated. It's not volatile. Basically, all depositors cannot flee away at the same time, exactly like it happened with SVB. SVB was a bank below $250 billion in assets, which meant SVB didn't need to stick to this net stable funding ratio, could have a very concentrated funding base, which was one of the problems. The more concentrated your funding base, the higher the risk. They flee away very rapidly. And that's what happened. The other thing is, if you are a bank below $250 billion, you don't need to stick to something called liquidity coverage ratio, LCR. So this is another rule that the regulators put up to say, hey, banks, you need to have a lot of liquid assets on your balance sheet because if Preston, Alpha, and everybody else at the same time goes to the bank, wants their money back, you need to be able to service these deposit outflows. Now, this liquidity coverage ratio does something very interesting, Preston, which basically is, I mean, if I ask you, what's the most liquid asset you can have? In the traditional finance space, you would say cash or any form of cash. It's just liquid there. If Preston comes and withdraws money, I can just give him the cash and I'm done. But banks also want to make money. So they ask the regulators, is there something else I can own on my balance sheet? I don't want a stack of cash there. I want to own some liquid assets that you will consider to be liquid. I can make some money in the meantime, but they can also be used to service these deposits. Guess what? The regulator said, well, will treat treasury bonds, mortgage-backed securities as well, basically as cash from a regulatory perspective. So listen to this. If you're a bank in the US after the great financial crisis, Preston, you were told that you must own a bunch of liquid assets to meet this regulatory requirement. And it could be cash at the Fed, reserves at the Fed, or treasury bonds and mortgage-backed securities and some corporate bonds. Because effectively you had no liquidity haircut on treasuries, so they will they were treated as cash by the regulator. And also you needed to own zero capital, and I repeat, zero capital against any potential losses that the tre- these treasuries would incur or these mortgage-backed securities would incur. Very, very little capital required. Basically, the regulator said to banks, go ahead and buy bonds, will treat it as if they were cash. Now, there are some proportions for large banks. They cannot own a bunch of corporate bonds, a bunch of risky credit. They need to own a lot more treasuries. For SVB, that wasn't the case. Remember, they were not subject to this liquidity coverage ratio, which meant 
they went ahead and bought $90 billion of mortgage-backed securities on a $200 billion balance sheet. And guys, I've been in the business. It's just a gigantic amount of mortgage-backed securities. So basically, the regulators have, in the US, made one big mistake, which is under-regulate small banks. So give them basically incentive schemes to act as cowboys. And the moral hazard at the SVB case was also very high because these guys didn't hedge their interest rate risk properly. They didn't apply basic risk management techniques. So they basically used the loophole that was in regulation to take an extremely large amount of risk. They had a concentrated funding base and they were wiped away because of that. But Europe, on the other hand, to answer your question, I mean, in Europe, we do a lot of things um, suboptimally, let's say, when it comes to uh, finance or banking, but the regulation is much, much tighter. So for instance, in Europe, Preston, there is no small bank that can be under-regulated that easily. Regulation is tighter in the first place, and it just looks after also what's, what's called a small bank. Also, again, guys, small banks, $250 billion in assets, that's not a small bank. Let me give you a European um, a parallel. The third largest bank in Germany is a $180 billion balance sheet. So that's the size we're talking about that in the US was deemed to be small enough not to be sufficiently regulated. So they were, this was a pretty miserable regulatory failure, I would say, in the US. Wow. You know, so I'm a hardcore Bitcoiner. Our show has tons of Bitcoiners that are listening in. And just to put it simply, I just don't trust the banking system because of everything that you've just described. Um, this ever expanding manipulation in markets to control fixed income and never allow creative destruction to actually occur um, is what we're really talking about. And in my humble opinion, uh, we aren't operating in a free and open market these days. And when you look at the at the size and the quantity of like some of these decisions that are being made by a couple people in the room, it's just it's kind of mind blowing. And I just see trust breaking down. As a person that really understands the legacy banking system, do you empathize with Bitcoiners and why they're turning to other alternate solutions to uh, storing their hard-earned capital? And um, just kind of what are some of your thoughts on like what this looks like from a systemic standpoint moving mm -hmm. forward with the with this keyword trust? Yeah. Look, um, the entire system, banking system, is effectively based on the on the assumption that collateral must be must hold its value and the collateral of the traditional fin financial system is treasuries everything runs around treasuries it's very simple to understand as well preston because if you go to a bank and ask for a mortgage and ask for credit they will price your interest rate on that mortgage on that credit on that loan effectively based on where treasury rates are plus a credit spread on top of it right so Imagine also treasuries are the foundation of the repo market where banks effectively exchange money with each other in a secured collateralized way. And that collateral is again, treasuries. So basically you have to think of treasuries as the foundation really of the entire machine. And you can also see the reaction of the Fed here, Preston, because what was about to happen was that some banks that were under-regulated were effectively mismanaging their risk, and they were facing a deposit um, outflow, which was very large. To service this deposit outflows, they were forced to sell their treasuries. The treasuries that the very regulators told them they could own because they were as liquid as cash. But of course, because of the interest rate hike, these treasury values were much lower. Mm -hmm. So they needed to take a massive capital haircut, capital loss to sell these treasuries. And at some point, they found themselves insolvent. So what happens then is, if you leave this unchecked, it will generate a fire sale on treasuries because more banks will find more losses on their balance sheet, more depositors will get nervous, they will withdraw deposits, and it will force a self-fulfilling mechanism where everybody has to sell treasuries to service these deposit outflows. So the Fed cannot allow this to happen, right? And it's basically... Again, a system which is based on 
trust on the value of this collateral. And if that goes away, the whole system implodes. So what the Federal Reserve does in this case is comes to the rescue and it says, ladies and gentlemen, this collateral is worth a hundred. You bought it for a hundred. It's a hundred. Just give it to me. I don't care whether the price is 60, 70, 50 or 80. I'll take it at a hundred and I'll lend you money against that at par against its nominal value at a hundred. That's yield wow. curve control. Wow. I, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about the difference between this QE and yield curve yeah, control. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of mechanics to explain, but my first reaction is, wow, this goes to show how much the system is built on the stability of this collateral. Mm -hmm. Because think about it, in 2008, the main collateral behind the banking system was house prices. In 2007, we were lending against the value of the houses like there was no tomorrow. And we were over leveraging the system with more complicated structures. And it, will, it was all based on one predicament. House prices in the US cannot go down, mm -hmm. Preston. This mm -hmm. was the predicament. As soon as the collateral value started going down because house prices started collapsing, then you had a massive problem because it generates a deleveraging of the system that cannot rely on the value of the collateral strengthening anymore. And you saw what happens, what kind of creative destruction, as you called it before, Mm -hmm. unfolds. But what unfolds from it is also political challenge, challenges. It's unemployment rate much higher. Mm -hmm. It's misery. It's, it's nothing that a politician would want to see because nobody gets reelected if he's the one to pinpoint for the, the great financial crisis, right? So this incentive scheme you're describing effectively make it so that the policymaker's incentive scheme is to keep the value of the collateral stable or rising. And that's what the Fed has done. The Fed has basically said, Give me the treasuries, I'll fund you at 100. So what okay. happens then is a couple of banks go in and they're like, yeah, yeah, please, I'll do that because I'm in trouble. I mismanaged my risk. I used the treasuries. I didn't hedge the interest rate risk. You guys hiked interest rates. The value of the treasuries went down. I'm in trouble. Well, you're telling me I can, you're telling me I can ignore this reduction in value. I'll use the facility. So I'll lend you the treasuries and you'll fund me. What this means is that the Federal Reserve is expanding its balance sheet again, which is something that we didn't see for a while as they were engaged in fighting inflation, trying to uh, keep interest rates higher, shrink their balance sheet. This has now changed again, and there are some differences between these and quantitative easing and yield curve control that we can discuss. But my main point is, as I told you before, the tagline is remember that your money is the liability of somebody else in the system. Choose whose liability do you want it to be. Now the tagline is the Fed and the system is predicated around the stability of collateral. And it is that important that the Fed has chosen to ignore the market value, ignore what is the market assigned value to these treasuries and give them a value of 100, an artificial value of 100, just to make sure the system doesn't implode on itself. So like me personally, I'm just, I'm looking at that and I'm saying, okay, so you're going to, you government are going to pick the winners and the losers. Um, even though these people mismanaged risk and they should uh, pay a consequence for that mismanagement in this system. Um, they're not, they're, they're getting, they're getting an advantage. Uh, people from up on high are, are saying, no, this person's going to get a bailout. They don't actually have to to deal with the consequences of their poor decision making, and therefore other someone else is paying that price, and I think that the someone else is the general population at, through just terrible policy making, and so like people like me that are Bitcoiners, we're just saying, you know what, no, my money is not somebody else's obligation because I have s stuffed it into Bitcoin and it doesn't have any counterparty risk, right? I, I just can't understand how, how people will continue to trust this system that continues to compound and spiral out of control with larger and larger bailouts, which clearly is the trend and not going away, when you have this other thing over here that doesn't require any trust that people can buy and uh, continue to hold and it doesn't have any counterparty risk. And if I want to move all of it to some other account right now, I can do that. 
Um, and I don't have to ask for permission from anybody. I just don't know how I don't know how the legacy system can compete with something like that, I guess, is where I'm going. Look, uh, Preston, the, the system is based on trust, as you said before. So it's, well, from a technical perspective, trust on the value of collateral being treasuries in most cases. From a user perspective, is the trust that the unsecured loan that you have made to the bank, basically by having money more than $250,000 in a bank, doesn't get blown away. Because at the first signs of stress, obviously, your incentive scheme as a user of the system is to say, whoa, I'm actually running counterparty risk with my money. Yeah. I didn't know that because, Preston, most people don't know that, exactly. that, they are, that they are running unsecured risk on a bank. They get a reminder, and then there are signs of stress. So the system only works, any credit-based system actually only works if there is trust in its stability and if the collateral holds its value stable or increases its value over time. Those are the two really major foundations behind the credit system. From time to time, we challenge those, right? Because the system in itself, if it works, leads to something very interesting, more and more and more leverage. Because look, what's your incentive scheme, Preston? If in a credit-based system, if everything is smooth, what you're incentivized to do is to make use of leverage because there is no volatility, there is no signs of stress. So how you, gen how you amplify your returns is by making use of credit, by making use of leverage. If everything is stable and you're sure that your job will be there for the next 20 years, you have a set of cash flows ahead of you, right? In, in a system, it's your salary. Your salary will be there, will actually grow a little bit year by year. So your incentive scheme is to make use of credit, to go to a bank and ask for a mortgage. A mortgage is nothing else than money being created now against the, your future cash flows coming from salaries. So what you're doing is you're relying on the stability of the system, which means you will have a stable job over time as well, and you're now getting credit for it. You get the credit creation, your mortgage, you go ahead with money that you didn't have, and now you do have, that's the credit being created by a bank, and you buy a house that otherwise you couldn't afford, and you push asset prices higher. And so banks have collateral values that go higher. So you see what the incentive scheme is here, right? If everything is stable, the system will create and rely on more and more and more credit. And, you know, the other side of credit is debt. Because you now have a mortgage. It means it sits on your balance sheet, Preston. It's, it's a liability. You are indebted, right? So for the system to keep working, you need to have more stability. And, you know, it just reverberates further and further. What happens at the first sign of stress is that in a system like that, the deleveraging is also very, very rapid and very painful. Japan has experienced something like that in the 90s. Japan has basically told us what's the way to go, what are the pros and the cons of bringing the system to the extreme. It has already shown us that about 20, 30 years ago. In Japan in 1989, the Imperial Palace of Tokyo was supposed to be worth more than the entire state of California. I mean... When I say this, this is pretty fun. But this was the result of excessive credit creation. Credit was ample and available to everybody in Japan. There was basically an over-reliance on stability of the system and more and more credit. What happened the moment that there was a sign of stress is that the system went into deleveraging. And look at the Japanese growth for the next 20 years. Preston, it had negative consequences for the productivity of the system. And it basically made effectively everybody poorer in real terms. Growth went nowhere for 20 years in Japan. And this is the risk you run when you delever such a leveraged system. So it's a very inherently unstable system that we keep artificially stable because that's the incentive scheme. Kick the can down the road, lever up more, keep the system stable so we can create more credit, generate more asset returns now, amplify our returns today. And by the very virtues of it, we're also increasing the instability of the system. So I do agree on that assessment. Yeah, it seems like we're at the coming up on the end roads from a global collective. Uh, you know, all this is intertwined. When I look at the European banks, the US banks, the Japanese banks, 
all of them versus uh, what I would describe as non-NATO countries uh, that are net producers and extracting raw materials. And they're saying, we don't want these these digital units that the NATO-based countries keep uh, expanding and debasing at a breakneck pace. We're, we're done with it. You can either pay us in our currency or you can pay us with gold or, or Bitcoin. Um, that's pretty much their stance. And that's what I think the whole the whole uh war in the UK in the Ukraine and everything that's happening from an energy standpoint over in Europe, I think really kind of comes down to that fundamental aspect. So I'm curious if you would agree with that. And uh, I'm also curious kind of your thoughts on how Europe is gonna be able to get any of their energy and high inflation rates down in the face of all of these banking decisions that just continue to compound on themselves creating this yeah. more and more unstable system. So Preston, so far we talked about the sources of leverage and instability within a closed economy, right? We discussed basically as if there is no external influence when you talk about an economy, but the reality is that global economies are interconnected. And most importantly, the dollar plays a central role when it comes to the global economy nowadays. And it has been the same basically since the 70s. This has led to something very interesting, which is the birth of the euro dollar system, which is nothing else than a machine that allows entities not residing in the United States to get access to newly created dollars. Mm -hmm. So it's basically a dollar funding machine for entities sitting outside the United States. If you run the global reserve currency in our system, you have one job and one job only. To keep your hegemony, you have to make sure that dollars flow freely outside or otherwise for other people that cannot create dollars, it's going to be very hard in periods of stress to cope with a system that depends on a resource, the dollar, that you are in charge of. So your job is to keep this flow of dollars free and smooth for the, the, the outside uh, world. So now what has happened is something very interesting because if the system keeps growing like it did, the euro dollar system over the last 20 years, what happens is that take a corporation in Brazil that sells, I don't know, soybeans or whatever they sell, some commodities, right? If most of your invoicing is in dollars, most of your trades are denominated in dollars, what you have done to enhance your business model over the last 20 years is also leverage in dollars, issue dollar bonds, get some dollar loans from a bank. This is a very interesting system because the Brazilian company now in the euro dollar system, ingrained in the global dollar system, needs two things. To be able to sell their soybeans denominated in dollars as much as they can, that brings in earnings, right? But it also needs these earnings to service their leverage on dollars. So what happens at the moment, then the global trade stop, that the growth, global growth comes down is that the company will scramble for dollars because it still has dollar liabilities to service, dollar leverage, but it doesn't see new dollars coming in because global growth is coming down. Very interestingly, what happens in that case is that even if the very, very problem is this dollar-centric system, the dollar gets a benefit out of it because these companies are scrambling to try and get the dollars they need to pay their debt. So the system deflates, deleverages, and it leads to a stronger dollar, which creates more problems to other companies indebted in dollars because their debt become worth more while their earnings are coming down. So it's a dollar wrecking ball. So it's a, the irony is that we have built a system where the problem in itself, the structural problem is the over-reliance on the dollar and to destroy the system, to change it basically, you first need to see a, a rush to the dollar, such a destructive rush to the dollar that it deleverages the entire system until we say, maybe this wasn't the best idea after all. We should look for another system that makes more sense. But you see the irony, right? Because a lot of people are saying, look, uh, dollar dominance will fade away. And it's hard to say when, Preston. I mean, these are very long cycles. They take decades to unfold. I do agree it will in the end. We have seen global reserve currencies change every 80, 90 years on average. We don't know if it's going to be 80 or 100 years. My most important point is 
to destroy the system from within, for the system to implode, you finally need first the dollar to appreciate so much that it basically kills everything else around it. And only then you will realize that the system doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think people instead expect the dollar to steadily depreciate in a destructive mode. But I think the path of least resistance is that you see one of these incredible rushes up in the dollar that just deleverages everything else around it. And then people will realize that that wasn't the right system in the first place. Yeah. As an American, as you're talking about the dollar and the advantage of it expanding, I, I think of a chess uh, scenario where it's like, the queen is such a powerful piece. And when you ask amateurs like what their favorite piece is, they, they almost always say, oh, the queen. But you also have to understand that the queen has a huge disadvantage in that you have to protect it at all costs. Because if you lose it in the game, uh, yep. your chances of winning are slim to none. And so you're you're almost become a, a prisoner of its power in that you have to respond when somebody checks it with a or they, they, they could they could take it out with a pawn. And so I see a very similar scenario with the dollar where it's become so powerful that the United States is now having to make decisions that are sometimes decisions that it doesn't want to make, but it has to make because they can't allow for the instability in the dollar because some other country or some other thing has has forced it to provide liquidity or swap lines or, or whatever the case might be. And so I see it in a very similar way. And your, your point about it becoming so strong and so powerful is basically akin to it holding the same power as the king itself, where if that piece goes out, the whole game is lost, is is kind of where we're going with with dollar dominance. Um, how, do, how do you see... So we're seeing the, the issues of the balance sheet showing up with with banks that are actually connected to the Fed rails. How do you see the risk kind of maturing from here with respect to shadow banks yeah. and insurance companies that have this massive float that often denominate that float into treasuries that might have long duration uh, treasuries sitting on their balance sheet as where maybe disaster strikes next here in the coming months? Look, Preston, this is the right question because if we have now defined that the Federal Reserve will try, their incentive scheme is to do their best to keep the collateral value stable, the treasury value as a collateral value, as, as stable as possible, and they have the tools for it, for instance, their new uh, bank term funding program that we discussed before, giving uh, par value to treasuries, even if their market value is way below par, they have the tools to ensure that. What you need to look for next is, okay, if the Fed wants to keep the system artificially stable, they can. What is that the Fed cannot control mm -hmm. to a certain extent? That's where normally you find the release valves historically. And you pointed to the shadow banking system and in general, other actors in the financial market that are less close to the Fed. And I think that is a very smart thing to do. And I see one big issue overall, which is credit markets. So look, credit stress is something that is very hard to fix for the Federal Reserve. We're talking about companies um, having a weaker balance sheet. We're talking about the real estate market taking a, a deep dive. The Fed has a much harder task in controlling those because they're further, further away from the epicenter of the system, the repo market and treasuries that they can so much influence. Now, let's look at the housing market, for instance, and I want to talk about real estate for a second because it's interconnected between shadow banks, banks, pension funds, insurance companies, etc. Between 2014 and 2021, Preston, interest rates were basically zero in the US the whole time. They were negative in Europe, by the way. Now, take a European bank. It has deposits and it has assets. And if interest rates are at negative levels, for European banks not to lose money, they need to charge their depositors as well, right? Because if their assets are making negative returns, the only way not to make money, uh, not to lose money, is to charge your depositors as well. By law, European banks couldn't apply a negative interest rates on deposits, in most cases for years. 
which meant that they were basically destined to lose money unless they did something on the asset side, Preston. And they did so. They took more risks. How do you take risks? Well, you either take more interest rate risk, but European banks are very well regulated. So it's very hard for a European bank to take a huge amount of interest rate risk. They need to hedge it very closely, which means you take other risks, credit risks. So you buy securities that offer credit spreads on top of the risk-free rate. The housing market is a hive for such securities. I mean, during the great financial crisis, we learned about all sorts of securities you can create on top of a loan, on top of a mortgage, CDO, CLOs, etc. The regulation had made it more complicated to make it, you know, that leveraged, but there were many securities, leveraged loans, CLOs, uh, commercial mortgage-backed securities that offered higher yields. So banks in a low interest rate environment went ahead and bought and bought a lot of them. The same happened to insurance companies and pension funds for the same reason. Preston, if you need to generate returns to meet future obligations, being your pension contributions to be paid out, for example, and your bonds are yielding nothing, you're going to look for yield somewhere else. So what I'm saying is when the system was too much artificially compressed and stable, this bred instability by giving the incentive scheme to shadow banks, asset manager, pension funds, banks, insurances to go and buy higher yielding assets, mostly in the real estate market. Did you know we have an awesome free investing newsletter in addition to this podcast? We have over 30,000 people reading the newsletter daily. So some of you are subscribed, but that's a lot fewer than the 100 million podcast downloads we've done since inception. If you're one of the 99 million people who have listened to our podcast, but haven't yet subscribed to our newsletter, join for free today by simply clicking the link here on the pop-up on your screen and then entering your email. In just five minutes a day, you can stay up to date with what's going on with your money and in the financial world. Join over 30,000 other readers now by simply clicking the link here in the pop-up on your screen and then entering your email. Fast forward to today, mortgage rates in the US have gone up from three to 7%. And we are seeing housing sales down 40% on a year-on-year basis. The market is basically frozen. Buyers are cut out. They can't afford. Sellers are trying not to sell because why would you sell if you're not forced to? You're locked in a mortgage rate at 3%, which basically means the market is frozen. Now, I think the stress is coming to surface now. We have had the first default of a commercial mortgage-backed security of over $500 million dollars by Blackstone. Blackstone and KKR are effectively the largest real estate investment trusts in the world. And before the default of these commercial mortgage-backed securities, both companies had gated the redemptions on the two largest real estate investment funds they have, which in plain English means that if you were an investor that invested into these real estate investment trusts and you want your money back, Preston, you can't have it back. You can only have a little bit each quarter. And why? Because if Preston Alpha and everybody withdraws money from these funds, they're forced to sell the assets, which means they need to sell offices, stores, multi-houses, etc. in this market where there is no buyer. This will lead prices to go down and this will lead probably to a fire sale coming up next. Mm -hmm. When I hear all of this and I look at the first default on a commercial mortgage-backed security and I think of the amount of leveraged real estate securities that have been bought by shadow banks, pension funds, and insurance companies and banks to try and generate some yield over the last seven to eight years, and I look at the state of the commercial and residential housing market today, I tend to think that while people are focusing on liquidity risks, that the Fed can backstop if they really want to, they can, and they are mm -hmm. trying hard to do that. Mm -hmm. They're missing the big picture, which is the credit stress, which is brewing under the surface. Yep. Yeah. The, how long do you think that this is going to take to to kind of percolate out? I, are we talking three months, six months window? Look, the amount of credit creation going through the system was already pretty negative before this banking stress. Mm -hmm. Now you have banking stress. In that case, money flows to the safest form of collateral you can have. Credit dries up further. 
Nobody wants to land very aggressively in an environment where there is banking stress. So this will compound the credit flow weakness that was already existing before this stress, mm -hmm. which means, Preston, look, I think policymakers have the tools to try and backstop this liquidity crisis that we saw. There are going to be a couple of casualties, but overall, they, they have the tools to backstop this because it's coming from an epicenter very close to their control. It's the treasury market, and they have almost a duty from a policymaker perspective to backstop the value of the collateral. And as we have seen, they have some very creative tools to make sure that artificially the system can be kept stable for a bit longer. On the credit side, they don't have these tools, and it's not even their job to have these tools, to be honest. So the answer is, look, my out-of-consensus call on the Macro Compass, which is the uh, research firm that I run, was that the recession in the US would start in late second quarter this year. So that would be like May or June. I think this call is now vindicated even further because what you're seeing is a credit crunch, basically. So further, a further deterioration in credit conditions for the real economy, which will probably accelerate the downturn. And especially when it comes to um, real estate products and the real estate market, I see things going pretty much sour over the next few quarters. So, uh, Alf, these numbers that we're talking about are trillions and trillions. I think that when we saw the amount of I would call it all these PPP loans that went, that happened during COVID and how it basically just turned into basically free money for banks that that took out the loan and they just yeah. dissolved the loan part of it. It just became money into the system. It, it almost seems like we're going to see that times two, times three, as they try to uh, resolve a lot of these risks that I agree with you are coming in three to six months uh, from the, what, the time we're recording this. And I think it's going to be way bigger than what people can even begin to wrap their head around. Would, would you Look, agree? Yes, I think there is a, a risk because of the size of the market. The housing, the real estate market is by far the biggest asset class in the world. Mm -hmm. If I would ask you, is it the bond market or the equity market? People would say, ah, I think the equity market. You need to combine the bond and the equity market together and you still are not at the size of the global real estate market. This is how big it is. Yeah. Okay? It's a very leveraged system because of the mortgage market underlying it. Right? It's a very credit-driven system. And we have just discussed incentive schemes over the last seven to eight years for institutional investors to go and pile up on leveraged products in the space to try and generate some yield. So I think there are quite some, uh, quite a confluence of negative factors that could make this pretty bad. The fourth one is the following. This always surprises me, Preston, but in 2020, we printed a ridiculous amount of money. And I mean like real economy money. I mean like money for Preston enough directly in our pockets, which was just bank loans given away like there's no tomorrow, checks yeah. reaching our inbox straight away with no direct liability attached to it, like literally new money that you can spend, no liability attached to it, right? Now, we did so much and if you wait, if you pull all that money into the system and you wait 12 months, you are undoubtedly going to see stronger growth, stronger inflation. People have more spending power. They literally have more spendable money that you have created. And so we saw this temporary growth and inflation, right? That was the end of 21, the beginning of 2022. But guys, in 2022, we have abruptly stopped doing that. No new stimulus bank lending came down slowly but surely as the economy started deteriorating. So you are seeing basically a disinflationary impulse from a credit creation perspective that is at least as bad as the credit creation on the way up. So for what reason you shouldn't expect now the same magnitude or even a bigger magnitude, Preston, as you just discussed, as you had a strong growth and a strong inflationary impulse on the way up, you should expect quite some deterioration in economic conditions as the result of the opposite effect that we had in 2022. It just works with a lag. So you need to wait for another three to six months. But I think that we're getting pretty close to the point where the tightening in conditions, both in credit and in financial condition that we saw in 2022, the system can't handle that together with the 
natural embedded leverage that we have built in the system, in the products behind it, and all that we have discussed so far, I would say making the case for a relatively bad recession is not something you should discard. So we often talk about all the issues and kind of where it's going. And and whenever I think about central banking and this legacy system that we all operate within, uh, it just seems like it's a crescendo that's just growing in systemic stability um, as we're moving right on the timeline. Um, how do you see this resolving itself? I you you know my opinion. My opinion mm-hmm. is I think Bitcoin has a major role in how this all gets resolved and actually brings stability to the system in the long run. I'm curious if you agree with that or if you see some other uh, way in which they can actually right the ship and actually bring stability back to the world without ever growing uh, systemic risk. No, I don't. I don't think that's possible, Preston. It's if you want the world to grow organically without having to engineer leverage and credit, that happens via more people actively contributing to economic growth. So a a growth in the labor force and by more productivity. If you have those two, then the world can grow organically. And it makes sense, right? You're growing the pie by having more people contributing to growth and having them more productively so contributing to economic growth. So then you don't need any artificially created environments or credit creation or leverage to boost growth. But, you know, look at the two things I just discussed, labor force growth, where, like, if you look at Europe, Korea, China, Japan, most developed economies, they will have a negative labor force growth over the next 20 to 30 years, Preston, and negative labor force growth, which means you don't even have enough new young people to replace the retirees, you'll have a shrinking labor force. So you have less people contributing to economic growth. And when it comes to productivity, we already made most of the ben- most of the we already saw most of the benefits of technology permeating many sectors of the economy. So that productivity growth is behind us. We keep growing year by year in terms of productivity, but it's too little. So then you have to use these tricks. You have to create more credit. You have to get more leverage year after year after year. And again, the policymaker incentive scheme will be to try and keep the system as stable as possible. They will manage probably for a bit longer. This will increase the inherent instability of the system in the first place. So where does it end? It's actually a good question. Look, uh, I think this is rather a death by a thousand cuts than anything else. So the pandemic was the perfect excuse to try and restore the system, Preston, because it's an exogenous event. It's something that you can't control and you can't predict, right? So policymakers could have said, well, the system is deleveraging. Uh, We need a new form of money within a new credit system. If you want to make the credit system, otherwise we need a new sound money system. Let's work to it together. This could have been an option. The reality has been the opposite, where they have doubled, tripled, quintupled the normal reaction they have, right? Gigantic QE programs, gigantic fiscal deficits program, artificial stability being brought back to the system. And this tells you where the incentive scheme lies, Preston. It lies into bringing the system to a higher and higher and higher level of inherent instability by trying to make it more stable. And I think that's where we are going to go. What's the end game? Look, I'm a bit, this is a very interesting question. And the reality is there is one asset which is already sitting on the balance sheet of most of these decision makers, policymakers, I mean, and that's gold. It's already sitting on the balance sheet of central banks, of governments, and it's been already this hard asset that we have tried to pin credit creation against during the gold standard until the 70s. Gold, though, has a lot of problems with it, right? I mean, it's not fit for a new system in a new technological environment. Gold is not optimal to serve that that role anymore. So digital assets can play a role into it, but then you need something that is reliable, trustable, scarce, uh, that cannot be increased in supply. So when I say digital assets, obviously you need to shrink your, your field if you want to try and refer to that asset 
then probably Bitcoin gets the closest to it. And look, this is a very long-term process, Preston, and I don't think it's going to be disruptive in a way that a major external event accelerates it. Otherwise, the pandemic would have been the perfect candidate, ex ante, right? It's an exogenous event, still didn't serve the purpose. So I think it's rather going to be a death by a thousand cuts, trying to make the system more stable, but in reality, making it more unstable as we go. And then at some point, the system will have to move to something different. This is my last question for you, Alf, is uh, there's a lot of people uh, writing and talking about the U.S. and and many other countries being in a death spiral with respect to uh, as they look at their tax receipts and they look at these higher interest rates that they have to roll their debt over to, um, the interest expense is exceeding what they're bringing through the door. So are we in a debt spiral? You talked a little bit about this potential for deflationary forces and call it six months to a year from now, hopefully dropping rates back down and and not uh, realizing that death spiral. But um, in the long term, is this the start of the debt spiral that eventually kind of percolates out or uh, do you not see that being where we're at? Uh, Look, there are two things to be said there, Preston. The first is what really matters in our traditional finance system is real returns and real interest rates. So most, a lot of government liabilities are actually indexed to inflation. So that means that if nominal interest rates are going up because inflation is going up, then you have kind of natural offset because these liabilities are indexed to inflation in the first place. That's the first comment, which makes the problem a bit less, you know, um, problematic, but still makes the problem exist if you have much higher nominal interest rate on your debt, even if some of your liabilities are indexed to inflation, you're going to have a problem over time. Well, the answer again is policymakers can fix problems, artificially so, that are very close to the core of the system. And in this case, this could be fixable artificially via yield curve control, for example. We have done it already during the Second World War and post the Second World War to make sure that we could fund the war, we could fund the rebuilding post-war. So we have said, look, these are the costs of borrowing. Even if inflation goes higher or lower, we're going to keep it there fixed. And this is yield curve control, right? So we've seen Japan doing that now for many years. Again, those are not sustainable solutions to structural problems we have discussed, Preston, but people need to be realistic and understand that the closer you are to the core of the system, treasuries, repo market, the value of collateral, interest rate on that, this system can be made artificially stable. This increases long-term the instability of the system. It breeds further instability, which often pops up somewhere else. And in this case can be the housing market, the credit market, the shadow banking system, as we discussed. So frustration can run very high for a long period of time because this can take a lot to play out towards the end game. And I invite people to follow the cycle, study macro, be informed, and also respect the cycles and the time lags that we are discussing while keeping an eye on the big picture. I know it can be difficult, but it also can be done and it helps people, I think, investing their money in a more, um, you know, risk adjust, generating better risk adjusted returns for their investment portfolios, always keeping the big picture in mind but respecting these macro cycles and policymakers incentive schemes that we discussed. Alf, I love having you on. I love having these conversations. I always learn something new whenever uh, you come on, but uh, give people a handoff to uh, your Twitter feed or anything else that you want to highlight. Well, if they want to follow my work, uh, the best way to do that is on the macrocompass.com. So the macro compass is my macro research and portfolio strategy firm. What I do there is I try to break down these complex macro topics in plain English and also keep people informed about macro developments and market developments by giving them actionable investment strategies so they can better manage the risks around the macro cycle while keeping in mind what's the big picture ahead. All of that, it's on themacrocompass.com. And obviously, I have a Twitter feed as well. That's at macroalf where you'll find snippets of all this macro analysis and occasionally some pizza pictures because I am Italian after all. 
All right, Alf, thank you so much for making time and coming on the show. Thanks, Preston. Always a pleasure. Really what's happening with Silvergate, and by the way, this applies to Signature, it applies to Silicon Valley Bank, is... I guess that's that's where we go next. Are we in a spiral that they're going to not be able to get under control or, or what's happening? I really have been saying for a few years now that we are going into hyperinflation territory. 